Hi, thank you for joining us for another installment in our virtual avocado festival series. We've had a fantastic time speaking with researchers, experts, and historians who've all had amazing experience and insight into this amazing fruit. My name is Jason Supies, Community Education Specialist at UC South Coast Research and Extension Center here in Irvine, California. I'm joined by my co-host, uh, also Community Education Specialist, Tammy Majerik. Before we get into it, if you'd like to browse the library of content we've created for this virtual avocado festival, culinary demonstrations, lectures, and a treasure trove of avocado grower resources, including our guests' full presentation, please visit ceorange.ucanr.edu forward slash avocado festival, or you can find links on Facebook and Instagram using our handle at UC South Coast. Today we're joined by Greg Rager. Greg is a UC Master Gardener here in Orange County for the last 10 plus years. He's been involved with the California Rare Fruit Growers and has a passion for hobby farming. Today we're going to talk to Greg about the do's and don'ts of growing avocados, whether you're looking to plant a small grove um, or just looking to put a tree in the backyard. Uh, Greg, thanks for taking the time to join us today. Thanks for inviting me to participate in this. So it's, uh, it's exciting to share some of the things I've learned over the years, um, most of it at uh, South Coast uh, Research Station uh, with other folks. Thank you. Um, how did you get involved into the wide world of home orchards um, and what, what yeah. kind of sparked your interest in uh, rare fruit growing? Um, I, I didn't grow up in a place where there were avocados. Um, I grew up in the Midwest. My uh, grandfather worked for the railroad, so he would go to a lot of the places. And in Indiana, uh, pawpaws are a native fruit that grows there. That's the largest Native American fruit. And he would bring home those pawpaws and um, also the persimmons, the uh, American, the Virginiana persimmons. So I grew up with those fruits thinking everybody knew about them. And it was only when um, I eventually, through my travels, I grew up in a military family, but eventually I ended up in California. And um, I hadn't tried uh, avocados until I came out here, but I was looking for whether or not I could grow pawpaws and, um, and uh, persimmons that I grew up with got involved in the California rare fruit growers and eventually um, found out about the South Coast Research Station. And through that, um, in the voluntary work there, I was able to sample a lot of the, the avocados. And it's been a, quite an experience because there's a, finding out there's a wide variety of avocados that are out there and you know, taste buds are and seasonal changes and all those things that affect the quality of the avocados. So it's been a very interesting uh, ride in the 12 years or so that I've been actually out there at the research station. You have avocado trees at your home? Um, I don't out here right now. Um, I moved out to Temecula about eight and a half years ago. And um, in this side of the 15 freeway, it's a little bit too hot and a little bit too cold for avocados. Um, we're right across the freeway, uh, pretty much from Fallbrook, which is known as the self-described avocado capital of the world. But they're on the west side, or sorry, the east side of the mountains, so they're protected from the sun. That being said, I do have some... Uh, Mexicola, we'll talk a little bit more about the variety, but I do have some Mexicola seeds that I've been growing to act as rootstock out here. And um, I do plan on trying some avocados out here. We are uh, possibly going to be moving, so I don't want to plan anything to know whether I'm staying or going. But um, with a little bit of care, I think I will be able to actually grow some varieties out here. That's awesome. Um, and we'll talk more about what we can do to prevent, in cold areas, prevent them from, from freezing. For sure. So for those uh, listening or, or watching um, who may be looking into possibly planting a, a hobby orchard or just, you know, a tree or two in the backyard, um, what are the, some of the, the site considerations uh, they need to be aware of uh, when growing avocados? 
Um, the main thing with avocados, oh, thank you for the slide. Uh, the main thing with avocados is they don't like wet feet. They, if you are, um, I used to live in Westminster, uh, Orange County, and uh, the, my neighbor had fantastic soil right across the fence, and I had clay. And they, they don't like to live in an environment where they have wet feet or wet roots all of the time. That's the main consideration. And one of the ways around that is to create what they refer to as an, an avocado. And that is a, avocado, or a volcano shaped planting area. And this is uh, a couple uh, images that I combined together um, off the internet. And it, it shows you how by getting that avocado a little bit higher up from the level of the lawn, it's going to help it survive. Um, avocados do not like uh, the, the, the roots. The root system is very shallow. Um, the exact number escapes me, but I believe it's somewhere in excess of 95% of its root structure is in the first 12 to 16 inches or so of the soil. Wow. And the, we use a lot of their leaf litter as mulch, and you want to mulch it with approximately uh, four to five inches of mulch. Ideally, you want to have the, if you've got clay soil and you can put it above the ground, um, you don't want your landscaping, the water draining into a hole that's created. So you want to have it above the ground level of the rest of the landscape. And you want to check, ideally, before you plant it, see how acidic the soil is. Avocados like a soil with an acid range of about six, a pH range of six to 6.5. You also have to pay attention to where's the sun coming from. They, they do not handle a lot of heat very well. I had one cinder block wall in my property in Westminster and it faced west. So I'm not going to put an avocado tree in front of that wall because as the sun passes noon, it's just going to be um, blasting that cinder block wall and it's like an oven there. So you wanna find a spot that is protected a little bit from the sun. The other way of getting around some of the soil considerations with this is if you have a slope in the backyard. I know a lot of the properties in Orange County you're kind of on a hill, you may have an area that's raised in the back or a slope. That might be another way of solving that soil problem. Uh, another thing that I've found helpful is to incorporate a, a, a four inch drain pipe, it's referred to it as a French drain, where you have off to the side of the root structure, another area where you can put that drain, dig a, a deeper hole for that drain to fit into and it goes below the level of the bottom of the hole you've dug for the avocado. And a lot of times you'll fill that with, uh, you know, rocks and gravel. Um, ideally, they put a, a screen or a burlap bag around it before you put it in there, so it kind of filters out the, the dirt from clogging it up. And this gives the water an area to drain so that your root structure doesn't basically drown. One of the things that we hear a lot um, at the research station when we have the open houses is, oh gosh, I planted this fruit tree, whether it was an avocado or a fruit tree, and it did great for three, four, or five years, and then all of a sudden it died. Well, typically what, when you get into the second, third level questions, you find out that it was a clay soil and um, it, everything was lower than the surface level of the rest of the lawn and the water, when you're watering the lawn, it just goes in there. And you might as well put it in a ceramic pot with no drainage holes and it can survive for a few years, but ultimately it's going to die. So those are the things that, that I would consider to be the most critical things. Finding out, do you have a sandy soil? Do you have a, a, a sandy loam? Do you have decomposed granite? All of these things are all going to be issues that you're facing. Uh, obviously, if it's a sandy soil, the water is going to drain away right away. If it's a clay soil, it's going to sit. So these are some of the considerations. Um, on the sheet, it also talks about what they call a percolation soil test. 
bottom line is you, you dig a small hole, you fill it with water, let it drain for about an hour and then fill it again. And if the soil, if that soil drains that water fairly quickly, then you know you have a sandy soil. If that water is sitting, uh, you know, 12, 24 hours after that, you have other issues to concern yourself with. And all of this is information that you can either look at the stack that's going to be available to you or do searches on the internet. For, that. for sure. Now, you say that the avocado doesn't like um, too much water or standing water, but it's certainly not a drought tolerant uh, tree by any means, correct? That, that's, you're absolutely correct. Um, matter of fact, out here in the Temecula area, um, they are paying um, growers to take out the avocados and the citrus are out here. But now these are commercial fields. These are not, you know, your homeowner where you've got one tree in the back. But they're taking them out in, in an effort to plant a lower water usage uh, crop such as grapes. Um, and a lot of your wineries out here are, are taking advantage of that. It's also a function of how big is that tree going to grow? And we'll talk more about this during the presentation. Um, to, to net out that story is if you've got a huge tree, you've got a huge root structure and that huge tree is gonna require a lot of water in order to maintain it. This is not typically what you want to have for the homeowner that's got a tree or two in their backyard. You wanna maintain that size and we'll talk more about that when we talk about pruning. Sure. Going back to mulching, I know here at the center in the last couple of years, we've planted a large number of new avocado um, trees uh, as a part of a research project. Um, and we've been able to kind of see that uh, avocado uh, style of mulching. Can you talk to a little bit more about uh, mulching uh, and weed control? Sure. The, um, the, the mulch that you have, uh, a lot of people um, will rake up all the leaves from all of their fruit trees and, you know, they'll put them in the trash and, and then they're recycling them and, and uh, maybe, maybe or maybe not recycling them. Um, I prefer to have any of the leaves from the avocado and, and the research station when you uh, go there. We do have open houses there. Tammy's the coordinator of that. And when they have open houses there and the folks are able to uh, go out as a group into the field when you have the tours there, you can see the, the mulching that takes place. And that mulch does a variety of things. It helps, first of all, the main reason is it helps keep the weeds down. Um, it also helps protect the roots. Remember, we talked about the shallow root structure of avocados. And you don't want to plant your avocado tree in an area where, um, around what we call the drip line, when you have the canopy of the tree, where the edge of that tree is, that's where the dew kind of collects and it, it drops down. And we call that the, the, the drip line. And that drip line is where you want your mulch out to, because you don't want... Uh, anything that's going in there and compacting the soil because then it's going to be more difficult for the roots to, to get the nutrients they need. This, the mulch also helps reduce your water usage, and that's a, a great thing. For areas that are hot or dry, uh, such as Temecula, uh, if I'm ever able to get my trees planted, um, I'm definitely going to mulch out here because having that mulch in that you know four or five inch layer is going to help keep the root structure cooler as opposed to having the tree exposed and the, the blasted um, heat um, coming down occasionally gets over 100 degrees out here and that's not going to fare well for the avocado tree. So helping it keep its root structure cooler, it also helps reduce uh, uh, seeds from weeds sprouting and when they do sprout it's very simple to just reach down and pull it out because the, the roots haven't gotten into the dirt, they're into the mulch, and you can hand pull them with no problem whatsoever. Um, mulching will also help improve the structure of the soil. Um, a lot of times they will talk about its ability to hold water and retain water. If your ground, if you look at some of the areas where they the hills and whatnot that don't have any vegetation, when it does rain, the, the rain just falls right 
right? Just keeps right on going to wherever it ends up at. And that's where you get a lot of your erosion. By having the mulch around the tree, it's going to help retain that uh, moisture. It's also going to help improve the soil. Um, a, a lot of the bioorganisms will then thrive in there, and that's going to help improve the soil. The house I had in Westminster when I first got it, as I mentioned, it had a lot of clay. And about five years later, when I left, I was using a, a variety of different things to help put that soil back in. There were hardly any worms when I got there. And when I left, the worm population had just expanded because it had a lot of things in there that it could work with as opposed to just being a pure clay. It's a good indicator um, of healthy soil for sure. Exactly, and it's gonna help improve the soil. One other thing about the mulch, it's not something where you wanna have that mulch right up against the tree trunk. Um, we'll be talking about some diseases here shortly. And you wanna have a what has been, best been described to be by um, some close friends in the gardening industry, uh, kind of a donut around the base of the tree. And it's you know, eight to 12 inches where the tree can breathe. You, wanna, you do not wanna put that mulch right up against the tree trunk, have that donut around there where, uh, and the mulch has to be replaced generally on like an annual basis. If, cause it's gonna decompose and it's gonna compact um, and making sure that you have that mulch. When we're out at the, the research plots, um, the volunteers that are out there and the, the uh, staff at the research station around the avocado trees, it may be literally um, six to eight inches of just leaf litter. Matter of fact, you have to watch <laughs> where you're walking a lot of times because um, you know the, the leaf litter is so thick and that's part of what helps improve that soil up there. Sure. Ray, would you say that um, probably having the spacing of the width of your hand in between the mulch and the, the tree? Would sure, that's, the as, that's as good a rule as any, um, absolutely. Um, having the, uh, the, the main thing is that you have that space for the tree um, trunk to breathe a little bit. Um, especially if your mulch, if, if you go to the, any of the box stores, and you buy mulch in the in the bags, the big bags, and it's really fine. It almost looks like potting soil. That's probably one of the worst things that you can put around there because then not only uh, you, there's no air for it to go in there. If you have real chunky, the big chunks, like two inch chunks, it may not be quite so critical, um, but yeah, sure, the width of your hand or what I, eventually would like to have in my perfect world if I have a, a demonstration garden down here is I'm thinking when the trees are small just get a like an eight or ten inch um, pipe and cut little sections and have that act as a collar and it kind of helps keep it around but that might be another thing whatever you use to keep it away from there is, is helpful. Sure. One of the things when you talk to folks um, the the novice uh, who are growing anything, any kind of tree in their backyard. The one thing that seems to hang people up the most um, is pruning. Because yeah, I, I feel like a lot of folks think, you know, if I make the wrong cut, that's, you know, three, four or five years down the drain. Um, and so can you uh, talk a little bit about pruning and maybe dispel some of the, uh, the, quell some of the fear that people have about pruning their trees? Sure. Um, it's the pruning is probably one of the the most challenging things. Um, I I have a, a bad reputation. It's well earned, by the way, um, of being a, a heavy pruner. Um, a dear friend of mine that, that also works at the field station. She's a very delicate pruner, and I'm a heavy-handed one. And part of the reason is a lot of times we go out together uh, to take look at trees that have been neglected for a long time and that's where you can really get into trouble because if you are maintaining the trees as they grow it's a whole lot easier than trying to go in after it's been neglected for five or we've actually gone out on some places where the trees have been neglected for 10 years and then you're really having to do some some radical things um, the advantage of avocado trees is if that um, height is maintained on a regular basis, 
Um, and just a re refresher to you, the bigger the tree, the bigger the roots. And a lot of times if you do your research on that, they talk about avocado trees um, destroying sidewalks and driveways. Well, yeah, but what they usually don't tell you is that tree is 40 feet tall. Um, if you maintain the tree to a level that's comfortable for you, somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to maybe 15 feet, then most of those problems go away because you won't have those, those highly invasive roots. And this has to start when the tree is fairly young. Generally speaking, avocado trees don't need much pruning. Um, they, they will occasionally get some smaller dead branches on the inside. Matter of fact, those are usually about the size of a pencil. And those are very easy to just, especially when they're, 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 they're dead, just break them off with your hands. Um, the other thing is make sure your pruning utensils are always sterilize before you use them because that's another very easy way for things to get transferred, diseases and whatnot to get transferred from one tree to the other. Um, maintaining what we call the skirt. You, you have the canopy, the leaves that are coming down. And eventually, if you're not careful, those leaves may touch the ground. And this might help the tree stay cooler during the summer. But by the same token, when those leaves touch the ground, it's also a, a perfect venue for rats and mice to crawl up your tree. So maintaining it, we call it the skirt. So maintaining that skirt, get it up a little bit. This will also help the airflow underneath the tree. Um, we talked about making sure that the, the tree has room to breathe under there. And that's another thing that can help that. Um, just trying to think of other things that might help the, the gardener. Um, your tree, hopefully, if you've maintained it properly and it's 10 feet or so tall, you shouldn't have to get out the heavy lopters, loppers to um, prune the branches. Um, hand, hand pruners will work, but don't exceed the limit of what those uh, pruners were designed for. Um, don't let the branches get real tall and leggy. A lot of times a leggy branch is an indication that the tree is trying to reach the sunlight. So look at what else is around there. They're, they don't do well as an understory tree as it were. So if you have a, 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 a eucalyptus tree or something like that, which might actually kill the avocado tree because eucalyptus trees don't like competition. But the, if it's in shade all the time and you get these real long leggy branches, they're probably trying to get sunlight. So um, the downside to having a long leggy branch is if you do get fruit on it um, and all of a sudden that fruit load is too much for that tree, then that branch breaks and then you have problems because you now have an open area for disease and insects and you also have possibly an open area in your canopy. Should such a thing like that happen, and we a lot of times see that with the neglected trees, and, and you do get a branch that's broken, um, probably the best way of, of fixing that problem um, is to get uh, a latex paint, whatever color you happen to have around, mix it with a one or two parts. I usually go with two parts of water and paint that on there that acts as a sunscreen. And that's another thing that you can do to the trunk, the bottom of the branch or the tree, when you, uh, before it's developed the canopy, and that's going to help it against a uh, sunburn. It's a relatively thin skinned uh, tree. The bark on there is not very thick. It's like citrus in that regard. So you have to be a little careful with um, how thick the bark gets and protecting the sunburn. Other than that, you're just pruning uh, to control the shape and the size of the tree. You don't want one branch to start going way out in one direction because then it's going to offset the balance of the tree. And over time, that, that one branch may take over and all of a sudden you've got a big, huge branch you've got to cut back. So kind of look at the shape and more importantly, control the size. That's probably the, the biggest thing. I want to circle back um, and I'm glad that you brought it up. Uh, I know it's something that uh, we're mindful of here at the research center, 
um, but I'm not sure um, how much uh, attention folks at home pay to sterilization of tools. Yeah. Um, can you just talk real quick about, you know, what's a quick and easy way to, what's the best practice for the homeowner uh, in terms of tool <sighs> sterilization? Boy, that could be <laughs> that could be a can of worms. Um, the reason why I say that, if you talk to a half dozen different people, you're going to get 12 different answers as to what's the best device. Um, the the simplest form of this, and you're going to hear people that will talk about using a weak bleach solution. You're going to have people that will talk about using a, a simple Lysol in a can, which which I think is is really advantageous because Lysol in a can is something you very easily carry with you um, in, a, in a bucket that has all of your tools with you. Um, the, the other thing that I hear quite often is a diluted solution of pine salt. Um, I, I know from an official standpoint, it's, there's a little bit of a concern about recommending certain products, but these are things that um, I have found helpful in the past. Uh, both bleach and Lysol, if you use them, or pine salt, I should say, pine salt, not Lysol. Um, Lysol in the can, pine salt in the bottle, that's what I mean. Um, both the pine salt and the bleach, you typically would dilute one part uh, concentrate to 10 parts of water. And if you use either one of those, you can have it either in a small container, which I find problematic because that container gets knocked over, or you can put it in a small um, spray bottle, which is helpful. Uh, downside to bleach is if you don't clean your tools after spraying it, it may cause rusting of the blades. Pine saw doesn't seem to do that. Matter of fact, the the uh, the solvent that's in that pine salt actually acts somewhat as a lubricant, so it's actually filling a couple different roles there. Lysol in a can is once again very easy to use. Um, you just spray it, um, and uh, it's something that you can very easily. If you have a lot of, if you know you've got some diseases, you certainly want to spray it when you go from one tree to the other. But it's a general rule of thumb to use whenever we're doing uh, pruning in the, the research plots. We're very particular about that because we don't know what may or may not be there. Everybody tries to keep an eye on diseases and pests. But uh, if I'm doing some serious pruning, I generally will, will spray between trees just, just because I'm, I'm concerned about that. Yeah, and one of the things I could just add to that would be um, if you're working with a disinfectant um, is to read the label. Um, something that we've all learned here in the past three months is, um, you know, Lysol and Clorox wipes all have like a minimum amount of time that it needs to sit on there. Um, so for folks out there um, who will begin sterilizing for the first time, you know, don't spray that stuff and just wipe it right off. It, it needs to sit there for at least a few minutes. So be sure to read those labels. Absolutely. And I'm just as guilty as the next person. Yeah. Um, a lot of times I'll wipe it on my pants. Um, but uh, if I'm thinking ahead, I actually have uh, what, what in the restaurant industry we call bar towels, just a simple cotton cloth, an old uh, washcloth, anything. And uh, if I have my bucket with me, I keep that with me to, uh, to kind of wipe off the blades um, in, in between things. And that also helps. Um, I've ruined more plants or pants forgetting that I've got the bleach solution and I wipe it on my pants and now I, over time, that, that will wear out into the, the fabric on that. You got a cool ass. The main brush. thing with the bleach is to make sure that at the end of your working, you um, clean the blades really well and oil them. Uh, with some sort of an oil or a silicon lubricant, because otherwise you'll get rusty blades from that. Okay. Another uh, aspect of um, home care for trees that um, some homeowners, um, or not just homeowners, but anybody with a space for a tree, another thing that seems to trip folks up is fertilization. Uh, can you talk about the fertilization needs of avocado? Yes, there's a, a, in the, uh, there's a slide there, you can pull that up. Um, probably one of, the, one of the, the three or four most confusing things about gardeners is that they will uh, either over-fertilize or under-fertilize their tree. A lot of times um, 
I've I've asked because the questions come up when we have the open houses there. Um, you know, my tree is sick. It's it's doing this. It doesn't get any fruit. And usually the first question out of my mouth is, well, when did you last fertilize it? And you get this kind of blank stare and they go, what do you mean fertilize? And that usually means that it hasn't been fertilized in, in the whole time it's been there. Um, you have uh, typically when you go to the stores, there's a uh, NPK, there's a, there's three numbers that uh, deal with that. And it talks about a concentration of nitrogen that may not be on that slide there. Um, and those are a ratio of nitrogen and um, uh, phosphorus and potassium that will be used for a variety of different fruit trees. You typically will find it in the when you go and look for that, a lot of times it's referenced as an avocado and citrus fertilizer. That's that'll be fine. Um, and a lot of times it's references like 10, 10, 10 or triple 15. Um, and the nitrogen is the, the first number. And a, like any other food substance that people will eat, too little is too, a problem and too much is also a problem. Um, if you're concerned about, especially with the mature trees, you don't necessarily need a lot of a canopy at that point in time. Uh, so you may have a, a fertilizer where that first number is lower. Um, and you may also find you've got a situation where you want some trace elements. There's a lot of trace elements like zinc and molybdenum and a bunch of other things that are in there. And those are elements that uh, are used in minute qualities, quantities, sorry. And the you, you also need to look at what is your tree telling you that it needs. If your leaves are yellow, a lot of times that's because it's a, a nitrogen deficiency. If the trees have a, a streaking, if the veins of the leaf is streaked versus the rest of the leaf, the leaf, the vein is green, but the rest of the leaf is a different color. All of those are a different indication that there might be trace minerals that are, that are needed. The best way of finding that information, particular to your tree and your environment, is the university has a, a wonderful website. It's, it's called the IPM, the Integrated Pest Management website. And that will be, um, uh, the website will be available in the, the downloads. And that is more information on that website than you're ever going to need. It covers pests, it covers um, diseases, it covers fertilization, it covers fruit trees, ornamental trees, and it's just a, a wealth of information on there. A lot of people um, out here in Temecula, uh, we have a lot of horse properties and a, a lot of people will use fertilizer out here. On our property, we have um, right now about uh, 40 chickens and we will use uh, some of the well composted chicken manure or um, the horse manure um, as fertilizer for a lot of the trees out here. And that, that saves us from having to buy something in the store. The downside to fertilizer is you don't know exactly what the, the ratio of those components are, but generally there's nothing in there that's, that's gonna hurt anything. Um, you have to be careful if it's something that you get from a commercial horse stable because you don't know what might have been used as a uh, injection in the horses, whether they're steroids or any of a number of things that could be used in, in, in a, medicine, a medicinal purposes there. Um, but we know what our vets are using out here and I have no problems with using some of that fertilizer. But one caution about using uh, manure as fertilizer, make sure it's well composted. Uh, typically with our chicken coop out here about once a year, I do a deep clean where I scoop out um, the, the six inches or so of the soil in there. And I, I filter out the big chunks and put the rest of it in a compost pile. And I don't think about it for six months or a year. And a year later, when it's time to do it again, that first pile then well composted then ends up in all my potting soil, I just mix it in with my big batch of potting soil or use it uh, around the fruit trees that we do have here. 
and then the new batch uh, replaces that. So I did the same thing with the uh, horse manure. If you are using, um, I'm always hesitant, we haven't gotten to it yet, but um, any fruit trees that you, while we're on fertilizer, let me just do a broad statement, a statement here. Any uh, fruit trees that you have in small pots like kumquats or something like that, um, it's best to fertilize it with a weaker solution more often. Uh, we're going we're to have a separate conversation about avocados and pots. But for right now, just suffice to say that some people find that fertilizing their trees more often with weaker solutions is better than, you know, oh, I forgot to fertilize it for the last two years and now I'm going to um, oversaturate it with fertilizer. And you might run into problems because you may actually burn the trees. That's the problem with using what we call hot manure, fresh manure is it may cause some burning of those. Um, that's also going back real quick to our mulch conversation. Make sure your mulch is not freshly mulched trees. Make sure that it's been well composted as well because freshly mulched trees, we took down a lot of trees on our property and mulched as much as we could. And that sat for about a year or a year and a half before we used it because if you use fresh mulch, it will actually pull nitrogen out of the soil while it decomposes. So you gotta be a little bit careful about that. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's about it on that. Gotcha. So if, uh, if our novices who are watching or listening are on board with the, uh, everything so far, well, let's see if we can't lose them uh, here when we talk about A and B flowers. Yeah, let's something, go there. Something you commonly hear, um, you know, oh, you can't just have one avocado tree. You've got to have a couple. Can you kind of dispel some of the myth and mystique around um, avocado pollination uh, and A and B flowers? Absolutely. And we're going to talk about the technical version first. The technical version, and once again, this will be available in the slide stack. The technical version is you have two flowering types of um, avocados. There's what's referred to as the A flower and the B flower. The A variety opens at a, as a female flower in the morning of the first day. It closes on uh, that late morning or early that afternoon, and then it will remain closed until the afternoon of the second day when it becomes a male flower. The bee, just think of it as the opposite of that. And if we have lost you at this point, don't be worried about it. The simple version of this is that you need to have a an A variety and a B variety to get the best crop yield. That doesn't necessarily mean you have two trees. You may want to have two avocado trees, but if you want to maximize your yield, it's best that you have an A variety and a B variety. If you do not have space for more than one tree, but if you have a neighbor or neighbors several houses down have an avocado tree, that may be close enough for the bees to fertilize it. Um, we have, um, uh, uh, we give a, a friend of ours space for his beehives on our property here. And uh, I found out not too long ago that bees will travel up to three miles to get pollen. So as long as you have avocado trees in the neighborhood, you should be fine. Um, uh, now, what tree varieties those are, that neighbor may know may not know. And if they don't know, then uh, my guess is generally, if you have three or four trees at three or four properties on there, somebody's got an A and somebody has a B and you should be okay. But if you have room for two trees or more in your property, then um, definitely make sure you get an A and B variety. And we have uh, detailed sheets that we'll provide you that will have that discussion. Before we move on, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about pest control. Um, when we were talking about fertilization, you mentioned IPM, Integrated Pest Management, uh, which is a division of uh, UC Ag and Natural Resources. Just wanted to take a moment uh, to give uh, a plug uh, to, I think, uh, not just avocados, not limited to avocados, 
Uh, this is available for apples, almonds, apricots, cherries, persimmons. I mean, and anything you can grow in California um, is going to be covered on this page. Um, the website is homeorchard.ucanr.edu. Um, and once you click on that, uh, find the fruit uh, or nut that you're looking for. And um, in terms of, you know, just for example, avocado, uh, there will be uh, site selection, planting, watering, fertilizing, sanitation, harvesting, pest management, everything that we've talked about in much greater detail um, is available free online uh, for anyone to grab that. Um, so talking about pests, um, I know here in Southern California, especially, um, people are uh, dealing with Asian citrus psyllid and, and all of the baggage that comes uh, along with that. Um, what, are, what are things that people should know about avocados? Um, what are some of the pests and problems um, that avocados encounter? There's, there's a variety of different uh, things. And the, the, for the typical homeowner, it can be a real challenge trying to figure out what the problem is and what, is it a disease, is it a pest, is it, um, is it uh, fertilization? And this is why I, whenever these questions come up, it's extremely difficult for uh, a verbal conversation for, to, to dig down into that without seeing it and without being out on location to look. The biggest challenge with this is can I identify, and at this point in time, if you have a variety of fruit trees, I would strongly urge you to invest in uh, what we call a loop or a magnifying glass because some of these little creatures are really small. And until you can identify, until you recognize that there may be a problem and identify it, um, you're, you're not going to find out what the solution is. Because the, one of the worst things you can do is apply the wrong solution to a problem. And you may be getting rid of some beneficial insects that may be helping you. One of the things that you will see a lot of times with avocados is you've got uh, some varieties of my, uh, mites and thrips, and these are typically very small. There's also a lace bug that will um, get into a lot of your other uh, fruit trees. Um, of course, everybody knows what a snail is. Uh, everybody knows what a, a, a mouse and a rat are. And these are typically uh, pests that will be eating some of the fruit. Um, we, we have a joke when we're out in the field that if there's an avocado on the ground, and the, the rats haven't eaten it, then it's probably not a good avocado because if they don't even eat it, then it's probably not something that uh, people will enjoy. But trying to find, um, and sometimes you have to look underneath the leaves, you have to really closely inspect the tree to figure out where, where the problem is. Um, another typical example is we, we see this all the time. Oh, the, the ends of my leaves are, are brown. A lot of times that's just from too much salt in, in the water um, that you have. And a lot of your commercial um, venues will actually uh, take steps to remove the salt before they uh, irrigate. Um, and that's a very typical thing. That's why when we do have the, the rains here, it helps. But trying to figure out, is it a, is it a bug or is it a disease? Um, the diseases a lot of times are this, this root rot. There's several variations of the root rot. And a lot of that is caused once again, because the, the, the tree, the crown, uh, doesn't have room to breathe. And you wanna make sure that that mulch is uh, kept away from the crown where the, where, where the tree trunk joins the, the root system and the ground. Um, you also have sunburn and sun blotch, and these are things that will um, uh, weaken the bark uh, to the point where the bark uh, literally, much like the first layer of skin when you get a sunburn, um, but unfortunately, a lot of times on your fruit trees, that bark does not grow back. And when the bark uh, is burned away by the sun or exposure over a long period of time, it's now a weak spot where the bugs and, and whatnot can get in. If you have a healthy tree, this, this is the best self-defense against a lot of these diseases. 
Um, also of a big concern is if you are uh, deciding that, gee, I want to add more avocados or fruit trees to my garden, be a little cautious of not going from a well-known source. This is a lot of times how diseases and pests are brought in from one area to the other. You mentioned the Asian citrus psyllid, and uh, this is a citrus disease, but uh, this in California was actually introduced by somebody who brought in a cutting that they were going to graft and they brought that bug in with them. So it, it, uh, it has devastated the citrus in both Florida and Texas. And it is somewhat well established here in Southern California. Um, we don't have that concern that I'm aware of. I'm, I don't consider myself an expert with diseases or insects with avocados. But um, that website, that IPM website that you referred to, Jason, is, is the best bet. I constantly recommend people go there because there's a lot of detail. There's uh, high quality photographs and my background is photography. Um, it, it's great when you've got good pictures for people to look at. It also has uh, descriptions and PDF files, uh, uh, Acrobat portable document files that you can download. And that's the best place that I can direct people because then they can take their individual problem and, and diagnose it from there. And then once you've diagnosed what that problem is, they will give you lots of options, both organic and, um, uh, but the least invasive uh, ways of solving these particular problems. And in some cases, it's just a very simple process of, um, temporarily removing the critter, or if it's a small population, sometimes you say, you know what, that critter helps eat another bad critter. And uh, a small population of them is, is, is not anything to worry about. And that's another uh, way to do that. Uh, fruit trees that get, that lose their bark is just wide open um, for infestations of a variety of different diseases and pests. Use this opportunity to uh, to make another plug. Um, here in Orange County, the Master Gardeners, of which uh, you are a member, uh, operate a free hotline uh, for anyone who has questions about not just avocados. We're talking roses or chrysanthemums or whatever it is that you're growing at home. Um, a hotline uh, for you to be able to ask questions. Um, if you would like somebody to you know kind of cross check your work. Um, the website for the Master Gardeners of Orange County is mgorange.ucanr.edu. And at the top of the page, you'll see a hotline. Uh, for anyone joining us in California outside of Orange County, um, feel free to go to the UCANR or the Master Gardener uh, general state website. Every county um, in the state has a Master Gardener program. Um, and so there will be some local help, um, free local help. Uh, available uh, for you there. Um, that's a good, that's a good point, and uh, I and I believe that organization. Uh, once again, I, I should know this off the top of my head, but it is nationwide. It is yeah. in many of the states. So Correct. Um, we have no idea where this uh, presentation is going to end up at. So um, great point. Check with your local state. Absolutely. Yep. Every state has. Um, uh, operates cooperative extension field offices in every county. Um, so Iowa, uh, Louisiana, Texas, um, everybody's got help um, pretty much in any county uh, in, in the country. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, moving on, let's talk about some varieties um, here in California. I feel like we are absolutely rich um, with what we're able to grow here. Can you talk about some of the common varieties um, that, that folks are growing here in California? Yes, and this was, um, these are um, some images that, that I took when I first got involved there, and it was quite an experience, um, not only learning about the avocados, but the, the fun part of doing that is um, when you're trying to get the hero shot, you, you have 
you have to go through a whole lot of avocados to get that one that looks perfect. And uh, so I really got indoctrinated uh, very quickly into some of the, the joys of some of these avocados. One of the things that we'll be furnishing for you um, at the end of this presentation is a document that I refer to as the, the avocado primer. And it's a document that in my ignorance and learning about avocados, I went to what I now know as the, um, the university website and accidentally found it and accidentally put some things together, which here 12 or, or 13 years later, I find uh, to be a tremendous source. But these are some of the avocados that you're most typically will find out there. Um, the, the Fuerte, the Pinkerton, uh, Haas or Hass. You're going to hear that both ways. Technically, it's supposed to be Hass as in pass, but having lived in Europe for a few years, um, I want to use the German pronunciation. So we talked a little bit about that earlier today, but the official pronunciation is Hass as in pass. Um, Charwell is another one. And if you'll notice when you're looking at these, part of uh, we haven't quite got to that point yet, but we'll be talking about its maturity on the tree versus its ripeness. And an avocado is kind of an unusual fruit in that it will not ripen on the tree. Um, it only starts its ripening process once it's been removed from the tree. And one of the ways to tell if it's ripe is we see this skin that's on the outside of the pit. And that skin, when it starts turning a little bit on the brownish side or with the Charwell, it's kind of a, a, a deep purple brownish uh, tone. That's one of your uh, first indications that that fruit is actually mature and ripened on the tree. Um, you'll notice that this will vary from an, not only variety, but tree to tree within a variety and even avocados sitting side by side on a branch. But you'll notice here when you're looking at these, comparing the size of the pit in relationship to the, the flesh of the avocado. And some of them, the pits are larger. Uh, some of them, the pits are smaller. And all of this is an indication of, um, the, you know, how many avocados do I need in order to get X pounds of uh, fruit for guacamole and whatnot. Uh, Fuerte is one that survived um, a, a severe California chill. Fuerte um, means strong, I believe, in Spanish. And I uh, meant to pull my guide out here, and I, I escaped without it. Uh, Pinkerton is one that you occasionally see. Um, I, I don't see that often in the stores. Um, I might see it at a farmer's market. Rarely will I see it in the store, but it's more of an elongated variety. And uh, it's, it's one of those ones where, uh, you know, when you're talking about any variety of avocado, taste buds are, you know, everybody's taste buds are different. And um, I've got several friends that don't like that strong avocado flavor. So they prefer the ones that are a little bit more bland, like the uh, Mexicola varieties. Um, Haas, of course, um, was a uh, California variety that was an accident. And it was one of those situations where it was created um, by an accident. A farmer planted a seed. And what he didn't realize is it turned out to be a, a variety that became popular. And it was in La Habra Heights, California. Uh, as the story goes, uh, Rudolf Haas in uh, 1926 had planted some seeds. He got three seeds. Uh, one of them uh, produced a tree. They tried to graft a fuerte to it. They, the grafts didn't take, but uh, somebody who was helping them with the grafting said, you know what, the tree's pretty strong, just let it do its thing. And eventually, to make a long story short, that avocado um, became very popular. And it was the first patented uh, fruit tree from what I understand, U.S. Uh, patent in 1935. And part of what makes this avocado such a good avocado is it can withstand the commercial harvesting. 
one of the things none of us want to take a fruit that somebody has put a bruise into it because they're they're checking to see if it's ripe and they press it too hard and then they put it back down because it's not ripe and a day or two later that that uh, fruit has a bruise on it and few of us want to take that fruit because it doesn't look pleasant the Haas avocado will actually it, it won't show that bruising you won't know it's got a bruise until you open it up and take off the peeling but it's got a wonderful flavor to it. It can withstand the commercial harvesting and with, with no other varieties available, I would say that's a very good commercial variety. I believe it accounts for 80% as I was doing some research for this presentation, the number 80% sticks in my mind of uh, commercial avocados throughout the world. So it, it has become kind of the standard. Charwell is known, it, Charwell is also typically a smaller tree, and if size is a big issue for you, uh, Charwell would be a good choice for that. It's known, um, uh, it, uh, it and uh, JB, Jan Boyce, are known as kind of the connoisseur's avocado. Uh, you'll notice the that, that shell, that paper-like uh, covering around the seed is a little different color there. Um, you'll also, a lot of times when you're referencing some of the avocado varieties, they'll refer to a flesh to pit ratio. And this is where it will talk about, generally speaking, how big is that seed um, versus the skin. And the uh, sometimes that's included in that ratio. But obviously, everybody wants a small uh, seed with a lot of flesh, with a lot of flavor, and trying to find that combination that fits your taste buds is, is all, always the challenge. And your your tree will vary. Its quality may vary from year to year to year, and that's uh, based on environmental concerns. You want to switch over to the next slide, please, Jason? Uh, Jan Boyce is one of those ones that you may hear about I believe I incorrectly misspelled that one, by the way. I need to fix that. It should be uh, two words. And that is considered the uh, connoisseur's av avocado. A lot of these may not be ones that you, that you see um, a, a lot uh, out there, uh, commercial, especially commercially in the grocery stores. Uh, Edronol, um, Helen, uh, we have a joke inside the, the avocado group that is it Helen with one L's or two L's. And I, I searched desperately for a variety with one L. I couldn't find one, so I don't know whether that's just urban legend. But um, Reed, if you only have room for one avocado tree, um, I would say if you're looking for an unusual variety that um, most people who have had the Haas, uh, Reed is right up there with the one. I would say if I only had room for avocado tree, that's the one that would be there. It's a fantastic avocado. It's got a, a fairly low uh, pit to flesh ratio. And I just can't say enough about um, the reed. Um, the, some of these other ones here, uh, they're included uh, because they're a little bit on the unusual side. And if we look at Nimlio up in the upper left-hand corner, you, you look, and by the way, I tried to use the same plate for all of these. I should have mentioned that in the beginning. And that will give you a little bit of a sense of how the the, the size of that avocado plays into it. Um, that, that plate was just uh, something as a background. And the Nimlio, the reason why I included that in here is Nimlio is one of those ones where it takes a long time for the fruit to mature on the tree. And you see that we've got some big ones that have the peeling has turned um, a blackish color. Those are now mature on the tree. And of course they're now ripe because I've cut them open. And you also will have on that same tree juveniles. And this is one where it may take 15 or 18 months for the tree to mature. This probably will lead to this not being a very good commercial variety because no commercial grower is going to want to wait 15 to 18 months to have a fruit that's harvestable. Uh, Surprise is another one that you may uh, find out there. Uh, that typically has a very small uh, pit size and you look at it in relationship to the flesh. Holiday is one of those varieties. Um, that's another good variety. 
and um, we're going to talk shortly about um, can you can a, a single avocado variety uh, produce avocados all year round and the answer to that briefly is no but holiday I, I like that one because it kind of got its name as I understand it because it's available around the holiday season we're looking at Thanksgiving um, um, you know uh, it may vary from year to year but somewhere around um, October to November to December and that's a good way to remember when that one's going to be ripened another variety that uh, oops back one another variety that you may hear about is harvest and uh, I know holiday actually came from the research that's done at the research center I don't know off the top of my head if part if um, harvest did you got it there Harvest. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Um, another thing, and you may actually, I'm seeing this on the harvest one, and that's a Jason's mouse is acting up. Um, if you look closely at the bottom of the pit on the harvest one, and just to the left of that fruit is, um, I, I don't think that was the same half. I think the left and the right halves or halves of there. But you'll notice you see what's the beginning of a root structure there. And this is one of those phenomena that we occasionally notice out in the field is if the tree, if the fruit is left long enough on the tree and it, it surpasses its correct maturity date, that pit may actually start putting out roots. And if you look closely at that, you can see where those avocados, when the pits were taken out, there was a root structure to that. At that point, the fruit may be exceeding its maturity date, and you may start losing the quality of the, the fruit at that point in time. And if you start seeing that, you now is probably the time to what we refer to as strip the tree, uh, take all the fruit off of that tree, because what you don't want is you don't want that tree wasting energy on trying to um, maintain the fruit on it when it should be trying to store up the energy for the next crop. And uh, that's one of those indications that, hey, the, the fruit is ready for harvest. Um, the last couple of varieties on there, if you don't mind, Jason, uh, gem and a lamb house. You, you also have some variations of the Haas avocado. A uh, lamb Haas is a variation of that. And Jim, I believe Jim was Jim from the research done there. Uh, UC Riverside. Yeah, but that's I thought it was. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that was one of the ones that was released from the active research that's uh, being done. Um, most of that's done at the Irvine uh, Station Field Station there, and that in itself is a long process. Um, we've we've made our recommendations. Uh, those of us that have volunteered. Um, and it's, it's a very long process. Um, the, the, from what I understand, it may take five to 10 years in order to get something officially, Tammy shaking her head yes. So I'm not too off, far off on that guesstimation. And, and I apologize, there's a lot of things that are, I'm, I'm a volunteer there. Um, and um, most of, of what I've learned is listening to some very bright uh, people and attending workshops and, and talking to people there. But there's a lot of things that are behind the scenes in the university, and that's one of the ones that um, I'm not familiar with exactly what the process is, and Eric may be able to help us out with that one. But um, they, it is active research, and they are um, still actively trying to get things released from there. So it's always exciting to see something that you've nurtured and, um, and helped move along um, eventually get released to the public. I'm going to add that to our list of questions uh, for our, our live question and answer session. Uh, yeah, Eric, it's, uh, it's, it's important. It question. is really important. And that's part of the reason why, um, I mean, when, when the research station was built in the early 60s, there wasn't a lot around there. And as you can now see easily, um, it's 200 acres of being surrounded by uh, communities. And so um, making sure that we still have a place for that research is important. Absolutely. 
Greg, uh, thank you so much uh, again for taking the time to talk to us today uh, and to share your your knowledge and experience with the avocado. Um, Tammy, anything else you'd like to, to ask of Greg? Um, not well, well, actually, yes. Um, where would you suggest that people might look to find, you know, some of these varieties? That That's an excellent question. Um, a, a lot of these varieties, um, you know, in the, you know, I, I would say probably in the last 15 years or so, which is where kind of my interest um, came about in the last 15 years or so, a lot of your, what we affectionately refer to as the box stores, um, they're getting a lot of these varieties in. And it's, um, you know, the, the California, if I can plug them real briefly, California rare fruit growers, when they were started in the 60s, um, the, a lot of the fruits that they talked about were in fact rare. Well, now a lot of these are not so rare. And I like to think of that organization as fruit diversity not necessarily rare because kumquats and, and avocados and whatnot was probably very rare um, with a homeowner back in the 60s. But if you go to certain areas, especially Westminster, um, they've got bananas and avocados and kumquats and, and dragon fruit. I mean, there's every, every house virtually there has something. Um, so if, if you go to a certified nursery, that's one place. That's, that's your first because they should be making sure that they get disease and, 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 and pest-free cuttings. We, we call those scion or budwood that are grafted to rootstock and that rootstock, and that's gonna be another conversation I think for the forum, that rootstock is a whole different set of, of issues and concerns. But when they graft that variety, you cannot take that, if I can real quickly, you can't take that seed from an avo a Haas avocado and plant it and get a, ha a Haas avocado tree because you don't know what genetics went into making that seed. You're gonna get possibly a Haas-like substance if it produces fruit eight or 10 years down the road. So what you want is a grafted variety and the research station is a, is a perfect venue when we do have the open houses there and, and Tammy and Jason are the coordinators for that. Uh, because that's where you can try some of these varieties. There's also avocado festivals um, in both um, Orange County. I know there's some up in Carp Carpinteria uh, on an annual basis. Uh, where all that sits now with the COVID, um, I, we don't know where those are going to be in the near future. But that that's the places to try some of those varieties. If you know the variety you want and they don't have it at the um, uh, Vista has a lot of nurseries down there, which may have some more, for lack of a better term, exotic varieties. Um, you also have the green scene that typically is once a year. We would normally had that in April of this year, but with the COVID it had to be canceled. And organizations such as individual nurseries and uh, private um, um, uh, organizations that uh, sell commercially, for lack of a better term. You also have the California rare fruit growers that make some varieties available. Um, and that's, that's another place to get some of these. Um, in doing the research for this, um, one of the ones that typically comes up is a queen because queen typically is a, is a big variety. And I, what didn't realize that that variety has been around for over a hundred years. I, I thought that was only there at the research station. And so and sometimes, um, but I am just a little cautious sometimes of somebody who has one in their backyard that you're taking a cutting from and you're, first of all, do you have a rootstock? Um, avocados are not a tree that likes to have multiple varieties to some tree. They don't like to be, um, converted into a spalliate. They don't like multiple varieties on one because uh, they're very easy to have one variety take over. Um, and um, so you gotta be a little bit careful with that. But those are probably the three, the, the nurseries, especially down in the Vista area. Nurseries locally, um, uh, you all know who they are. Um, I occasionally see, I'm, I'm a huge Costco shopper. A lot of times I see them and uh, they had a bunch of them there recently. 
I was not impressed. Um, it almost looked to me that whoever was selling them, it was the outtakes from some of the ones that they were growing commercially because some of the some of the, the grafted uh, uh, scion wood was actually doing kind of an S shape. And that's now going to be a really weak tree. Uh, but that being said, um, they do, I, I did see, I think there was um, Zutano, um, and there was also, uh, of course, Haas, and I think there was a Mexican variety there. I don't remember what it was now, but uh, those are some of the places to get some of these. Just be real careful where you get your, your trees from. That, that's great. So it's good to know that people are able to get them locally and, you know, are not limited to just the Hass or Freiter variety, but there's many other options available to them from the Right, there are, there are options. The and, you know, should you ever decide that you want to do your, your own grafting, grafting, we're, we're talking about possibly putting something together for, uh, for grafting, um, but uh, it's fairly, fairly easy to do. The main thing is, can you get a rootstock that's gonna do well in your, your neighborhood? And worst case basis, take on Mexicola one, um, and those are the, the dark, uh, smooth skin avocado. Plant the seed six months or a year later, you're going to have something that's big enough you can grow too. Because we hear this a lot. Oh, um, my parents' house in wherever has an avocado tree. We have no idea what it was. It was planted from a seed, but we love that one. And now we're selling the house. Can we save that? Well, you you've got to take a cutting from there and, and graft it to something. And that's something that can typically be done if you have the root stock. Um, but yeah, that's a good point. Anything else? I think that's it. Uh, Tammy, Greg, thank you guys both again uh, for thank joining you. us today. Um, to access all the content uh, for the UC South Coast Research Virtual Avocado Festival, we have culinary demos, uh, an avocado experiment, uh, looking to find out if there is a perfect way to freeze and preserve avocados. Uh, we have a lecture on the history of avocado marketing in Southern California, uh, and then also a talk with our researcher, um, Eric Folkt from UC Riverside, uh, who operates a project here. Uh, all of that information is available on our page, ceorange.ucanr.edu. Uh, Greg's presentation will be on there. The avocado primer uh, links to the UCA in our home orchard. Uh, really anything uh, you folks at home uh, would find helpful, uh, we've put in one uh, convenient place for you. Um, Greg, Tammy, uh, thanks again for joining us and see you guys back at the farm. Thanks for your time.